Welcome to the Who, What, Why podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Sheckman. Once upon a time, we were promised technology that would really change the world. Futurists and science fiction writers who often write the first draft of technological progress offered up a world of abundant energy, frictionless mobility, eternal health, and a greater proliferation of knowledge and wisdom. So what happened? Instead of harnessing the energy of the atom, we learned how to swipe left and right. Instead of flying cars, we got the ability to order a car over the phone. Instead of eternal health, we got, if lucky, the ability to fill out medical forms online. In education, we wondered if the whiteboard was really any better than the blackboard. Are these failures of imagination or of will? Or is there some complacency virus that entered our national bloodstream and slowed us down? Back in 1962, Jack Kennedy said we should go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Because, he said, that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept and one we are unwilling to postpone. When he said that, he wasn't talking about inventing social media or even the pocket phone or the ability to carry our music around with us. The goals were far bigger. Why have we failed so badly at doing these big things? We're going to talk about that today with my guest, Jay Stores Hall. He's an independent scientist and author. He was the founding chief scientist of Nanorex and president of the Foresight Institute. He's currently a research fellow at the Institute for Molecular Manufacturing and an associate editor of the International Journal of Nanotechnology and Molecular Computation. His work is suddenly garnering lots of new attention. His most recent book is Where is My Flying Car? And it is my pleasure to welcome Josh Hall here to the Who, What, Why podcast. Josh, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. It is great to have you here. There was a time, once upon a time, where we could do big things, whether it was go to the moon or move aircraft design along to create the 747, All of that seemed to stop at a certain point. What was that point as you see it? Well, as I see it, that was the inflection point in the Henry Adams curve. Henry Adams was uh, the grandson of John Adams and the son of John Quincy Adams. And he was a a man about the world in the uh, 19th century. And in his autobiography in about 1910, he pointed out that it was really one of the most amazing facts of his world that we had been able to use more and more and more energy over the course of the industrial revolution. And it, his prognostication of that actually continued well after he was gone until about 1970. And then what happened, this beautiful exponentially rising a uh, trend line of how much energy we had to do wonderful things with just flatlined. And since about 1970, the average American uh, is has not gained the ability to have any more energy at all, but in fact, somewhat slightly less. And that's also true of, of most of the more mature industrial uh, economies in the world, uh, notably Europe and uh, the uh, UK. Is that because energy became less abundant or more expensive, or was there something else at play? Oh, it, it was uh, a, a perfect storm of sort of the various things that, that could happen to you. But I think, and and this is you know my own take on the subject, but my, I think that what happened is that we just got dumb fat and happy and uh, quit striving to do more energy. And uh, once you get into that mode, the only way that you can sort of get ahead is to criticize what other people are doing and, uh, and and act like you're, you're being good and they're being bad. And the most obvious and uh, apparently effective thing that most other people were doing that came to be seen as being bad is producing and using uh, large amounts of energy. So when you look at the predictions made by the science fiction writers and the futurists and anybody else who was uh, making long-term predictions back in the 50s and 60s, 
they are the people who are expecting us to have flying cars and all the other stuff. And so what happened is that I went and, and in my latest book, I looked at all the predictions and I cross correlated them with what amount of energy a solution to that um, that prediction would have used. And it was a stark, stark relationship where if you made a prediction that required less than, let us say, uh, uh, 10 kilowatts per person, which is the level that we flatlined at, it generally came true. Um, and if you made a prediction where the solution to the prediction or, or the implementation of that particular vision of the future was going to cost significantly more than that in terms of energy, it didn't come true. To what extent was that individuals at corporations at the time trying to protect the status quo and really preventing innovation that might be disruptive to those that, that had been successful already? Well, there was a certain amount of that. Uh, it's a phenomenon that was noted by uh, Machiavelli 500 years ago, that if you're trying to, to do change, you better watch your tail because the uh, people, the powers that be got there by doing certain things and they don't want things done differently. So, but that's, that's part of the human condition. I mean, as I say, that was, that was Machiavelli's uh, observation in uh, Renaissance Italy 500 years ago. On the other hand, Renaissance Italy, things actually changed quite a bit and they have been changing, especially since the industrial revolution. So while that forms something of a stumbling block to progress, it can't be the whole answer because the things over the course of the industrial revolution of the, the 19th and, and first half of the 20th centuries, you had a lot of progress, a lot of new stuff. And, and there were plenty of powers that be that weren't particularly uh, concerned that the average person you know, did better and better. They just wanted to, to stay on top. Of course, we still have that with us. To some extent, what happened in the 60s and 70s was that the the Machiavelli uh, type situations got a little more firmly entrenched because people were less likely to look to technology as being the solutions to their problems. Um, and again, there was a perfect storm of things that, that made that happen in society, but it, all of the different sources of that lack of progress came together in about that time. And that's why you get beautiful, clean improvements in the amount of energy that, that people are, are getting all the way up to 1970. And, and that includes a, a, a large build out during the 1960s of, of nuclear power, for example. And then some people realize that they can make political hay um, and become known as uh, uh, saviors of humanity simply by opposing that and, and casting aspersions on it and, and uh, producing all sorts of fear, uncertainty, and doubt ab about uh, that kind of thing. And uh, so in the uh, social environment of the 60s, a lot of that stuff got traction that it simply would not have gotten uh, you know, decades or, or even centuries before. There was also a sense it, in that same period of denigrating technological progress. Yeah, and, and, and that's something that I was grappling with in, in the book because uh, just a century ago now, uh, the, the technological heroes, you know, the, they, they named towns after Edison, all of the, the people who invented the uh, airplane and uh, electricity and, and, and all the other stuff that, that we got that, that completely improved our lives. I mean, even indoor plumbing, okay? This is, this is not just frill, frilly stuff. It, it, it was, it's basic to the way we live now and have this, this really comfortable existence. But to some extent, you have a comfortable existence, you begin to take it for granted. So when I was writing the book, I was I was saying, look, you know, just a century ago, the the people who did things like Edison and invented the, the, the cool stuff that that we now take for granted were heroes. And they were they if you if you go back in, in uh, the, the Google engrams of the of the books of the 
and, and other publications of the day, you'll find that uh, Thomas S. and the Wright brothers are just as popular as uh, Babe Ruth. And, and, you know, the other uh, people that we think of as being popular sports figures and, and, and other heroes. But that just vanished. Um, and it was not until, I think, probably the Vietnam era where where that sort of changed. And it's uh, it's not clear to me why, uh, in, a, in a very general sense, that that happened and that happened then. But uh, but it certainly did happen. One of the things you point out, for example, just to take aviation as, as an example, that between the Wright brothers and the 707, it was 50 years. In the 50 years since, very little progress has been made in aviation. Now, what's happened in the meantime is that there's been huge progress on making the airliners more efficient and use less fuel and be cheaper to run and so forth. So uh, there, there hasn't been no progress, but the fact is that... Um, Airline travel available to every person is kind of stuck in a rut. And um, and that rut has been around since the 70s and the flat line of the, the Henry Adams curve and you know, of energy use. So we ought to be if we had stayed on the on the curve of airline improvement, uh, how, how fast you could actually fly and so forth um, uh, by buying a ticket on an airplane. Uh, you you go up to uh, the 60s, and then there is a a natural rut in the space of actual the physics of of flying, which is that you're getting close to having to fly at the speed of sound, and that's a lot more energy intensive. So they did did manage to build a couple of supersonic airliners back in that era, the Concorde, for example. And but they were not economically viable. And it's only now that people are beginning to say, OK, wait a minute, we dropped the ball here. We ought to be able to go from, uh, you know, London to, to New York in an hour and, and to Tokyo in two hours. Uh, and the and so people are beginning to look at that again. But in this particular case, you had not only the the economics and the lack of improving energy. Uh, you know, you 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 look at the future and you say, okay, we'll be we'll all be taking supersonic airliners, but that requires us to have continued to improve the amount of energy available to everybody, and we didn't. So that was the first part. The you know, the other part is is a bunch of sort of regulatory crud that accrues on everything. Um, if you just sit back and 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 watch, you know, there'll, there'll be more regulations about what you're trying to do uh, any year than, than there was the year before. And that's just apparently uh, a phenomenon of, of living in a highly bureaucratic country. But uh, uh, so there, there's that. Uh, that was a bit of a uh, problem for supersonic aircraft. But the main one was was uh, the flat line in the energy curve. And what accounts for, as you analyze it, what accounts for that flat line and for that stagnation in the energy curve? Well, I, I, as I was saying, I think it's a it was a there was a perfect storm of uh, social phenomena. Uh, so the 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 first and most obvious one was that people got richer and they got more comfortable and. They didn't sort of need uh, progress to bring them uh, to a to a comfortable place to be because, by and large, they had gotten there. If you look at countries where people are still poor but trying really hard, like China, for example, you'll find that they have not had a flat line because the uh, average person in China doesn't get anywhere near the amount of energy that we do, and so China is still uh, putting a putting more power plants uh, online essentially every year than we have. Um, I mean, this is just a huge country, and they're they're really building out, and they're and they're still s- skiing up that curve. And who knows when they will hit that point? But they're an example that one of the reasons that you you try hard to build out more energy is because you need it. And if you get to the point where you think you don't need it, or you can take it for granted, or or whatever then you don't try so hard. And all the other phenomena that have to do with where you build energy, like um, anything from environmentalism to simply wanting to invest in something else instead, show up and form 
a, a sort of a, uh, you know, trying to wade through mud. And if, if you don't have a, a strong wind behind you and you're still trying to wade through mud, uh, you slow down. And, and that's what we did. To what extent did the sort of countercultural revolution of the 60s play a role? The countercultural revolution of the 60s was a rejection of a whole bunch of stuff, starting with, uh, how shall we say, Protestant uh, sexual ethics and, and, and going from there. Um, and it turns out that if you're trying to object to somebody's society and way of life and all that sort of stuff, the first thing you object to is the thing that sticks out, the thing that is more obvious, the thing that is more powerful. And so in the case of the countercultural revolution, there were these people who are ready to object to just about anything their parents had taught them. But the things that were most salient, that were easier to get people riled up about, were the big powerful things. And so those were the ones that, that got attacked first. And of course, the environmental movement grew out of that. There was a, a substantial increase in the environmental movement. But I think in the, in the countercultural revolution, people were just casting about to find things that they could um, say, we're better people than you. And the environmental movement just got a lot of uh, feedback from that. The environmental movement you know, was around a century before when they started founding the national uh, parks and forests and wildernesses and so forth. And, and people began realizing that we had a, a really wonderful environment in this country that we should try and preserve. And it changed its character to some extent. And it took on a whole bunch of virtue signaling uh, aspects and, and, and essentially the, the aspect of a religion. There's something real there. It's just that like, like anything that is real, it can be uh, hijacked by people who are basically um, virtue signaling and, and, and trying to uh, put uh, themselves ab ab above and, and others and, 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 and use that as a, as a, as a social lever. Given that we have seen this migration over the certainly over this same period of time that we're talking about, that we've seen this migration more and more to cities and outside of rural areas and suburbs and, and nature, as it were, why hasn't that translated into more enthusiasm for the technological progress we're talking about? Well, it's a, a good question, but I think actually what happens is that Cities are just not done right. We, this is a technology we have not mastered. Uh, people who live in cities live in essentially an entirely artificial environment. And they are less happy than people who live in small towns who are less happy than people who live in the country. Um, and stats from the General Social Survey, it, it, it's just a, a fact. And what that means is when we have the opportunity to build the entire environment, the you know, complete artificial environment that, that people can live in, we just haven't done a good job. And I think one of the things that uh, if we have any sense whatsoever and that we'll look at is when um, in the future we had better start studying about how to build an artificial environment because a lot of us are going to be living in them no matter what, one way or the other. Um, we should start looking about how to build an artificial environment that is as pleasant to live in is, uh, and gives you as much quality of life as living in the country. One of the things that, that you talk about also is this extremism in the environmental movement, uh, this movement towards the idea that somehow humanity itself is a problem. Yeah, well, I, I, I think that's kind of uh, a self-defeating thing. So. And in the long run, I'm not worried about it. If everybody who thought uh, humans uh, <laughs> were, were the, uh, the, the poison of the earth uh, simply had the courage of their convictions and never had kids, um, they die out pretty quick. Um, and, and that's essentially what I, what I think about that. It, it, it's not something I'm particularly worried about. Uh, every so often, I'll, I'll see some expression of that and say, are you crazy? But that's about it. Talk about the, the stagnation that happened with respect to nuclear power and, and the reasons why you think that happened. Well, the first one was nuclear power was, A, big and powerful, 
um, and B, not well understood, and C, this is probably the most important thing, was associated in the public mind with nuclear weapons, um, even though it's a completely different technology. Uh, so, uh, I mean, you, you, you get people who, who use exactly the same word, nukes, for uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear power plants. And so the, there was a, a major failure of education on the part of people who should have been doing the education. And so, for example, after the, after the Three Mile Island incident in America, in which absolutely nobody was killed, and, and essentially um, the only major damage was purely economic. They, they, they ruined a nuclear power plant that cost billions of dollars, and so you know they, they were out billions of dollars. But there were a couple of things that happened. One was there was micromanagement by Congress who thought, oh, this is nuclear. This is like atom bombs. We have to have a direct interest and in, in tell everybody who's doing this exactly how to do it, even though we don't have a clue. Um, so that happened, and that was one of the problems with uh, 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 nuclear because the um, standard industry techniques like computer control of, of processes and so forth were illegal. But the other one was simply that um, the people who were the anti-nuclear forces went around and misinformed people uh, about the technology and the physics and so forth in a really, really big way. So right after Three Mile Island, people went and did surveys of the, of the public. And it turns out that something like two thirds of the, uh, of the public believed that a nuclear power plant was essentially a giant atom bomb just waiting to go off, which is way, way, way far from the truth. I mean, it's just, there's, there's uh, nothing whatsoever that could cause a, a nuclear power plant to explode um, in the sort of way that, that people had been told it could. And so it was uh, a, a, a wild, vast failure to understand the actual technology and, and, and the process on the part of the public. And uh, I think in this one case, you can lay the blame specifically on the people who were, who were promoting this, this disinformation. Normally, I think when uh, people don't understand something, that's just, you know, the way people are. Um, nobody is an expert in everything and, and, and rumors and uh, ghosts and goblins and uh, fairies and, and all sorts of other uh, beliefs will, will just grow because that's the way people are. But in the case of nuclear, it was, it was actually promoted. The, the falsehoods about nuclear power were were, were uh, intentionally promoted by uh, uh, certain political forces. So that's that's the the background on which the the then unfortunate decisions made in the political process uh, were made. And and it turns out that uh, we got some really bad luck, and we had a, a rabid anti nuclear guy be installed as the uh, head of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, at, at which point nuclear plants just quit being built. How much of it also comes from the fact that the evolution of nuclear energy and the splitting of the atom itself happened in such secrecy and was really about weapons, and, and that that was really the beginning of it as far as people understood it? Well, it was actually just science up until World War II. And then in World War II, everything became about weapons. Um, so uh, there is certainly uh, something to that point of view. Uh, on the other hand, the once we, we came out of the war, the Eisenhower administration, for example, uh, promoted, quote, atoms for peace. I don't know if you remember that, that we were going to now uh, take the technology that we had created and and put it to the service of, of humanity and and make poor people rich and uh, provide energy to the masses and, and, and share this with the world. Uh, so why did one government program succeed and the other one fail? I don't know. But there remained from the war a, uh, I mean, if you, if you just go back and, and read newspapers and science fiction and uh, novels and, you know, everything from uh, uh, on the beach to the ads for 
home fallout shelters that were in every uh, popular science magazine uh, in the 50s and 60s, they're, they're, the culture just picked this up somehow. And culture tends to run with something that is a scare story better than it does something that isn't. And that's just, as far as I can tell, simply the way people work. Where does all of this leave us today, in your view, looking forward towards maybe reinvigorating this desire to do big things? Well, I, I kind of thought I was a voice in the wilderness um, when, when I wrote the book. And, and the book was originally my uh, memoirs. And I was just going to, you know, say, you know, here's 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 what we all thought when I was a kid and, you know, didn't happen. Why not? But I was a bit surprised when Stripe Press came to me and said, we'd like to take your memoirs and publish them as a real book. And I'll give you an editor um, who made it a much a more readable sort of thing, by the way. It was it was a, it was just a re- meandering reminiscence <laughs> and my, my original version of it. But. So they did a good job, but it turns out there there is a a small movement of people who were uh, of like mind that that I hadn't even really uh, known about, uh, and I, because of the book, I've been privileged to meet many of them. And the other thing about them is a lot of them are are, are uh, young folks who uh, are much more likely to make the future than I am because I'm you know pushing seventy now, and uh, uh, so I. You know, all I can do is, you know, sit back and and dandle uh, grandchildren on my knees and says, oh, it was like this in the old days. But uh, the, the the young guys are actually uh, getting out there and, and doing stuff. So I I am more optimistic about the future than any time when I was actually writing the book. Where does digital technology, the the future of that, and you know things like Moore, Moore's law, which does seem to be going forward, although that seems to be in stagnation at the moment too, and and the prospect of AI, how does that fit into this larger equation? Oh, I think uh, it's a big deal. I mean, I I spent my whole career designing computers and and doing artificial intelligence, and I am really pleased at the the progress that we've had in those fields uh, and I mean, the, the, I mean, I have an iPhone that has more uh, computing power than any university computer I ever used when I was actually at a university. I mean, this is, this is quite amazing. And the, I, I probably don't even have to tell you um, what amazing things that the, uh, the new artificial intelligence, right. uh, the large language models and, and that kind of thing um, are doing. But what I can tell you is that the reason that they're doing it is because of the availability of enormous amounts of computing power compared to what we ever had in the 20th century. So um, it's it goes hand in hand. Um, but we're learning a lot about what it takes to make a, an intelligence. We don't we don't come close to actually knowing all of it. Um, they found this techniques that that just works. But, you know, in, in my my last artificial intelligence books, I predict that uh, this is 10 years ago that uh, people will suddenly start realizing this, these techniques are actually working and the money and the research and uh, the experimentation will just pour in. And that's exactly what's happened. So um, I'm very bullish on the uh, future of AI and of robotics. And I think ultimately that will feed back into uh, our ability to produce energy and um to understand how to unlock the energy inherent in the in the nucleus of the atom, um, and not have to you know worry about burning dead dinosaurs in the Earth's atmosphere uh, for to to keep from freezing. So all in all, I would have to say that I'm I'm uh, really a lot more optimistic than I was ten years ago about uh, how things are going. And do you anticipate? Push back to this, people that are that are fearful of this technology, and as we've seen repeatedly throughout history, people that are are concerned that somehow this is going to upset the balance of the status quo, both because it impacts them personally or it has a larger global impact as they see it. Well, you could in fact see a sort of a, a Machiavelli effect uh, mm-hmm. uh, pushback to AI, and I mean, for example, imagine that somebody realizes that you could take 
a somewhat enhanced version of a large language model and use it as a tutor for every single kid um, who is trying to learn stuff in school. I would not be surprised at all to find the the teachers unions opposing this, especially in California. But the but ultimately these sort of things happen. I mean, uh, a century ago, the musicians unions were uh, trying to keep people from using recordings of music because they, they were so lifeless. There were no live musicians playing this stuff. Um, and yet, you know, you, you hear more recorded music now <laughs> than ever in the in the world. So um, I think that there will definitely be resistance and pushback and, and Machiavelli effect backlash. But uh, I think that this is so much the wave of the future that it's not going to do more than impede it at the edges. And, and maybe it will bring about flying cars at some point. Well, let's hope so. <laughs> it would be nice. And before I let you go, talk about how an area that, that you're so deeply involved in nanotechnology and how that fits into this equation. Yeah, okay. I, in, the, in the book, I argue that the key... Uh, technologies that will shape the 21st century are nanotechnology and nuclear power sources and artificial intelligence. And I think they just go together in, 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 in a, a good technological way. And nanotechnology is essentially when we uh, reinvent life. The life is basically just a, a, a technology. It evolved, but it's a technology that uh, works with atomic precision at the atomic scale. And that's why living things are so much different from things that are not living. And uh, we have obviously used life and technology um, for our food to begin with, but for almost everything we make for as long as we've been a, a, a civilization out of the Iron Age. So that is going to undergo a, a tremendous change in the capabilities and so forth of, of of technology with nanotechnology where we are essentially able to harness the same kinds of machines that that living things use only more powerful and able to withstand greater variations in temperature and to use electricity as a as opposed to simply breathing air or something and in order to design all these machines we are going to need uh, artificial intelligence uh, and in order to power them, we're going to need power derived from nuclear sources, simply because uh, they will be able to use and to fulfill their potential, they will need to use that much more power. So uh, we're sitting on the edge of, of, of a whole nother industrial revolution that will change the world as much as the first one did. But I think those three basic technologies, and uh, when I say those three, I'm, I'm, I'm saying essentially that biotechnology, which is, which is going great guns right now, is, will just be folded in as a, as a subset of, of nanotechnology. Um, so uh, molecularly precise uh, physical technologies, information technologies that, that allow us to make good decisions at any scale from the atomic to the national, and the, a source of power that is essentially limitless and, and cheap and clean all await us if only we buckle down and get to work and make them. Jay Stores Hall, his most recent book is Where Is My Flying Car? Josh, I thank you for spending time with us today here on the Who, What, Why podcast. Well, I was happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And thank you for listening and joining us here on the Who, What, Why podcast. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.